Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. and I'm sure other people will be coming in as we uh, go along here. Uh, I'm Dick Carlson. I work in the Platforms Content Communications Group, and I'm the, uh, either the uh, instigator or the uh, benefactor here. Geez, I don't know what I am, but uh, I guess I'm the guy who uh, sort of dragged this whole thing together. Uh, came out of a conversation from my manager's manager about uh, different ways to get content out to people. Uh, in fact, the original article is up on our SharePoint if you want to read it. Uh, he mailed it around to all of us and said, gee, this is pretty cool. Uh, a few days later, a friend of mine by the name of Elliot Maisie, everybody raise your hand if you know who Elliot Maisie is. Okay, so I don't have to do much of an introduction. A friend of mine named Elliot uh, sent me mail and said he was going to be out here. He's uh, doing a keynote to 6,000 people tomorrow. And uh, he said it would be kind of fun to talk about things. And I said, that would be great, Elliot, but I want you to do a workshop for me. He said, okay. Um, and so what I tried to come up with was an idea of how can we use these new tools in content Promulgation. How can we use these to disseminate content? How can we get people to talk about the things we want them to talk about and to share? And if you go ahead and look at that uh, SharePoint site that's up there, you can see some of the ones I came up with, blogging and podcasts and things of that nature. Uh, and this is going to be a very free-form, open sort of thing. Uh, I've got two panelists here who have shown, and I have a couple more who might come in, so you can ask them some questions. Elliot's going to talk for a little while. And then we're going to take a break in the middle to do a little bit of work uh, in, in smaller groups, and then we'll do a wrap-up towards the end. We are web Webcasting this live, uh, going all over the world, or at least wherever we let it go. Uh, when I sent out this invite, I got all sorts of horrified uh, email from people in Fargo saying, you are going to webcast this, aren't you? So I managed to get a little bit of money from our org and put it together. Uh, the gentleman you're going to get to see, like I said, uh, I, I don't think he's going to need a lot of uh, recommendation. He tells me he was actually back here doing broadcasts for Windows 95. Uh, he works with Microsoft Learning, uh, has, has uh, done all sorts of interesting things with our company. His uh, learning consortium, uh, Microsoft, I believe, was a founding member, yes, and we are, we are still involved in that. And he's starting a new show this uh, fall called Learning, which is going to be down in, uh, down in uh, Orlando. Orlando. Uh, right on property. He did tech learn for a lot of years, and any of those of you who participated in that, like I did, uh, really enjoyed it. So this is Elliot Maisie. Thank you. I, I've got this. Oh, he's got his level there. Uh, it is a, uh, it's an honor and a privilege, and, and let me do that, too, but that sounds a little bit. Does that work better? I'm a little richer then. Uh, good. Oh, much better. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. And as Dick said, uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to spend some time with me, uh, I have a long and interesting, and I think in some ways related background to this. Uh, uh, I've been involved with Microsoft in many ways since almost the beginning of, of Microsoft and got to know Bill before he was wealthy or, or famous. Um, and one of my good friends that um, I've met along the way, Ray Ozzie, has recently joined Microsoft. So it's sort of a convergence. But I want to share just one quick uh, data point, uh, less as a credentialing, but more in many ways as, as a moment in which Microsoft took a step into the more extreme model of, of an open community for creating, I think, both content and, uh, and marketing opportunity. Back in 1994, uh, uh, the Windows group, as they were getting ready for Windows 95 launch, uh, came up with the idea that they wanted to build developer interest. And as many of you know, how many of you were involved in the rollout of, of Windows 95? So um, as you know, at the time, a, the concept of an open, uh, much wider beta, and then the concept of having Microsoft Television. And Bill and a few others got the idea that it'd be important if the person who did that wasn't a Microsoft person, the MC. So uh, my name came up, and uh, I actually had to do a screen test. The only time in my life I had to do a screen test. And for nine months, I traveled to Seattle once a week to do a live two-hour show called Microsoft Windows 95. And it was, it was 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, eventually one month before launch. And we found, at one point we had about 10,000 live, and we figured up to 100,000 uh, listeners and viewers of it. In fact, you could watch it on the Learning Channel at 3 a.m. It went around France and the like. But the deal was it would be live. 
that I would not be scripted. I could ask any question, and people could call in from around the world with questions about Windows 95. And it was particularly interesting as features got added and then dropped off in, in the beta. The biggest problem was in the middle of the show, um, I decided to get married, and my date for my wedding was during the May show. So the challenge was how, how, you know, and they asked me if I could delay that till after the lunch, but, you know, um, we had decided we really wanted to get married then. So we pre-taped my piece, and um, uh, Nancy Lewis, who was then involved with learning and education, was my substitute host. And we hiked the Grand Canyon that, um, that, that particular day. And we did a very funny thing where it showed me sort of on a beach in, in France and, and the like. And, as I'm, and my wife and I are walking down the Grand Canyon. As we got up to the middle landing there, this, this, this French developer, sweat pouring down his face, said, are you Elliot Macy? You know? And he went straight into talking about, he didn't even say hello or something. He started to ask me questions about how briefcase would operate on this thing. And then he said, hold on. You're supposed to be on the beach somewhere. But what was intriguing was that that was an unusual moment in which Microsoft decided to open up to the developer community and got the power of all of the, uh, the beta testers and the like. Now, even back then, I pushed a bit farther and I said, what if that community of beta testers could write the documentation? And the answer was, no, that could never happen because it had to be official, stamp sealed, and, and the like. So I was probably 10 years before my time about this conversation. And what I'd like to trigger today is a conversation about how does a company like yours harness the power of the emerging, what we call extreme learning tools, wikis, blogs, podcasts, would even go so far as to say gaming and simulation. But let's maybe focus heavily on wikis, pods, and uh, wikis, blogs, and podcasts, not just as a communication tool, but as a learning and as a development and content development tool. Um, most of the work that I do is with our consortium members who are Fortune 100 to 1,000 companies. And what's been interesting, I would say, over the last 90 days, heavily triggered, by the way, by the recent Business Week cover story on blogs. I don't know if you've seen that, and that actually might be an interest if you, if you, if you were to search on Business Week uh, and, and blogging. They, their entire cover story was actually written by a, as a blog, and their, um, their hits on their website spiked by about 100% in, in terms of that. But what we're seeing in the last 90 days is an incredible interest amongst learning, development, and content professionals about what would happen if we would harness things like blogs or wikis to do content development. What would it look like? Now, I was in one of these conversations, and it was the CIO of a company that I shall keep uh, nameless here. It was a, one of the Fortune 5 companies. And he took me aside, and he said, Elliot, I don't even know what a wiki is. Could you show me one? So I went to our own internal wiki that we use at the Maisie Center, and he was terrified. He said, what do you mean nobody has to approve the content? This, this would be a horrible situation. Uh, he said, we couldn't, that could never work here. And I said, well, let's try something. And he was, by the way, an old COBOL programmer. So I said, let's do something. Let's go on to Wikipedia, and let's have you change something on the COBOL site. So he went on there. We read the COBOL, and we actually changed a few lines. This was about 9.15. By 11 o'clock, we checked back. And it had been corrected, edited, and extended. And he said, okay, where do I buy the software? And then we got to the problem that it wasn't software for sale, per se, and then we got into a whole bunch of other issues. But he's, he's pinging me back almost every day, incredibly intrigued by what would it look like if we could use a community-based model of building, refining, developing, and extending content. And what would that do both for the harnessing of umpteen more subject matter experts, but also what would it do on a affiliation side? 
And that led to, in a few minutes, we'll open it up in, to, to a wider conversation with the panel, of what would that look for as well in terms of affiliation. What I would like to suggest to you is that what's intriguing to me, and I think many other folks in this field, about wikis and blogs and podcasting and other forms of extreme learning is the intensity and velocity of that. And I think those two phrases are, are I think, important ones to look at. It is not, per se, the counterculture of that. And there are a couple of folks who, have, who I think have argued, and I think I would disagree with them, well, these things work because they're countercultural. So, in fact, it's cool to go to a blog because it's not the official blog of, of, of the corporation. And while that may have some element there, what I really have seen, and we've done some usability testing in our own lab at the Maisie Center in Saratoga, is a tremendous reaction to people about things that are faster from a velocity point of view, more intense, more granular, and to which they have a perception that there's a community of preference or a community of reference. And you notice I didn't say a community of practice. Because a community of practice means I'm signing up to spend a lot of my work or play day there. But a community of preference is, in essence, what happens on Amazon.com when you buy something. That somehow content floats to the, to the top. Some of the ideas kicking around the industry, and as I said, we're not talking about something that's been going on for five years, relates to, for instance, could you end up having an object-based approach to wikis or blogs where I can set up my own profile of who do I trust? So I don't get to see every element of it, but I get to see the ones that are trusted. Could a company like Microsoft, for instance, code content? So this is officially blessed content. This is content from the uh, Alpha Warriors that are, are, are sort of our trusted, uh, our trusted developer community. This is content that's just raw and out there and user beware. But we're going to leave that out there and we're going to take the risk that it might not be something that we like, but yet it adds value to, to the process. Um, to give you the best example that I can of this, one of the things I do is I serve as a uh, consultant to the Department of Defense. And if you follow the role that, that blogs and boards played for ground soldiers in Iraq to get better information about how to self-armor their vehicles when the uh, Defense Department didn't do the best job of armoring them, they basically went first to some off-firewall sites to post and get that information, eventually pulled it back into some interior behind their firewall sites. I was in Washington at a meeting in which people were talking about, well, we've got to take this stuff down because it's not official. The documentation is better, and I pointed out that the documentation didn't say anything that was at all useful for them, and that their documentation process operated at the speed of bureaucracy, and they were, op they were trying to stay alive at the speed of a bullet, and that a blog and a wiki were operating at a velocity that was closer to the speed that the soldiers there needed to operate at. Well, I would... I would point out to you that there is, as I said, an intensity and an opportunity that's here. Uh, it's probably heresy because it's not a Microsoft device, but uh, I've been going around the country having done, in a, and not illegal but not published yet, hack into the Sony portable PlayStation to uh, basically take video that I filmed in Africa and Hong Kong that shows you how to shop and showing what would it look like to use a device like this, for instance, to do new hire orientation at a company. So let's imagine, I don't know how many of you have been to new hire orientation, but it's universally the least enjoyed experience that most people have. Um, they generally want it over quickly, and we end up spending too much time on too many things that are compliance-based, and nobody particularly remembers it. But what if you could literally hand somebody a device like this, which is wireless, is peer detecting, in fact, if there's another device in this area, and not only let somebody be a consumer of it, but have them, as they go through it, re-edit what new hire orientation looks like for the person who's going through it a week later. 
To me, in fact, some of the best people to do new hire orientation are people who were hired six months ago. They have the freshest idea of what the induction and onboarding process are. But they, they're never turned to as subject matter experts. So we turn to the person who's been here 10 years or 12 years. But once again, we lose intensity and very often we lose velocity. Two more points and we'll, we'll go to some, some broader views here. One is our subject matter experts are getting exhausted, discouraged, and disincentive. Um, all around the world, we're seeing subject matter experts saying, but I don't really get promoted for being your subject matter expert. I get it for doing my job. So you're really asking me to do this at the expense of my own performance review. And one of the conversations that's rolling around some companies now is what if we could ease up the role of the SME or the subject matter expert and extend that by increasing the numbers of that. The second process is what if we could actually produce our content around the feed model, whether we think of it as RSS or Atom or whatever other feed model you want to use, so that every time that I went to do something that involved learning, I could click and get a continuous feed of that. A great conversation I had on, what's today, Tuesday, on Monday, I was in New Orleans yesterday, was about was with a, uh, a physician who was saying, what if every time the FDA changed the rule, I got an auto feed of one module that I needed to look at and then recertify on at the end? Now, if I got 10 modules out, my certification went from green to yellow. And if I got 20 modules out, my license was suspended. So now we're looking at certification as being a dynamic self-testing element. The other concept that they'll out to you is self-healing documentation or self-healing learning. So as we start to talk about the role of the, the, the net as a self-healing entity. Finally, the, the thing that uh, I would throw out as a, as a concept to, to consider is that individuals who get an opportunity to participate stop becoming consumers and walk into a new realm of something. One of my favorite sites is the Audi A4 site, and I don't even have an Audi. Okay, but my IT manager loved his Audi, and he went on to the A4 Audi site. And in fact, what's interesting, I don't know if any of you are Audi owners, is there's better information on the A4 site than you'll ever get off the official Audi site. If you go down to Audi Mechanics, they very often have the A4 site open as their reference in that, in that area. Why? Because once you contribute to that site, you've changed the model and you suddenly have moved from a pure consumer to having a sense of community in that process. So those are some beginning trigger points and we can get into some questions as well. But we've got uh, two panelists here and so I thought I would share the mic and just get some perceptions from, and if you want to introduce yourselves in case uh, folks don't know who you are. So hi, I'm Shafin Charnia. I work in the Platforms Marketing Group. Uh, focused on a variety of things, including um, communications and how we reach customers in broad ways, and then on learning as well. Yeah, I'm Craig Bartholomew. I'm the uh, general manager for the group. It's the Education Products Group. We're located over in HED. We've got a couple of our teammates over here, and we produce generally products for for uh, both institutional learning and uh, and consumer educational learning. I'm Robert Dupre. I'm an instructional designer, program manager with Microsoft Learning. And then we include certification, courseware, and um, Microsoft Press. I used to work with Dick Carlson. And right now we're working on templatizing learning so that other people can actually create their own learning. Great. Uh, why don't you start? I mean, what, what are some of the things that are rattling around your head as you think about a more viral approach to both learning content and, and, and the marketing side of it, obviously? Yeah, my bias is more in the marketing side, and um, one of the things that we have tried to do is look more at the issue of um, the effectiveness of our current marketing strategies. So we spend a lot of money on advertising, we spend a lot of money on direct marketing, uh, and a variety of other different methods of marketing. And the questions that we've been asking are, are there stickier ways to do marketing? 
and are there ways that are somewhat more genuine? Um, advertising traditionally, whether it's Microsoft or otherwise, is tr perceived as being less than genuine. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to a more connected, how do you get to more connect to your audience, get them to be more immersed in, in what it is that you do and be your advocates as opposed to simply a consumer of your product? Yeah. And, and let me throw out just a couple of thoughts, too, as, 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 and, and love to get your reaction to it. One of the things that struck me over the years is that you get a tremendous quantity of customer feedback that gets anonymously washed on the way in, meaning you have it. It's highly granular. It's highly valuable. But when the product comes out, other than some broad recognition that hundreds of thousands of hours of feedback went into it, there's very little acknowledgement on the way back out. I just got back from one of the ERP companies' national conferences and found it interesting. For the very first time when they, dis they, they, they talked about a product improvement, their CEO got up and pointed to 90 different people's input that led to feature changes in their software. And I was in the back of the room and watched that group high five each other, you know, and there was a t there was a very different sense of what that that very valuable stuff was. Now, who knows if those were 90 people selected politically or randomly or 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 the not? But I, I'm, I just wondered some of your reactions. I think it's a it's an awesome idea. I think what you end up with is two parts. One is obviously those 90 people are going to be very strongly supportive of that product and committed to its success because they're part of it and they're going to help you move it in ways that maybe it wouldn't have moved before or advocate it. The other part is maybe there's another 90 people in the room saying, well, damn, I'd like to be on that list too. Right. And for the next version, they might be more inclined to participate or uh, commit some degree of vestedness to the process. So I, I think it's an excellent idea. It's It's um, it would be a very interesting thing for us to look at doing maybe with some of our products. I'd, we'd have to imagine how we'd do it, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's totally an interesting idea. Yeah. It also allows very granular recommendations. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, Dick mentioned our, our conference, uh, Learning 2005. Uh, we just launched as I was under a non-compete until the first of the year. We haven't sent out a single piece of mail, and we have about $700,000 of registrations already. Now, the way we got it was we got about 250 people to write quotes about why they were excited to come to an event that never happened. And then we've been sending those quotes out to people in their industry and region. So we're getting this whole accelerant process of that, which, by the way, has no net cost to us other than the admin time of doing that. So rather than going for a single unified endorsement, we're trying to get it from your industry, from your city, from even somebody who has a name that sounds like your name and, and, and the like. Um, what, what's your sense uh, if you well, think about some extreme forms? As we, as we look in my area, you know, we, we're generally looking at, we're not looking at the marketing side or whatever. We're looking at, at content creation and ecosystem enablement and spurring the ecosystem to do more in education. So the, the areas that we have spent a lot of time looking at are the wiki area as well as game-based learning or, or, or the spurring of game-based learning. And when, it, when an Xbox game costs between $4 million and $8 million to create, you know, it's just beyond the realm of what an educational institution or an educational publisher is willing to invest. You know, educational publishers are generally looking to repurpose what they already have. The uh, individuals don't have the resources to do all the work. So we're, we're looking at how do you templatize and make available and create kind of an ecosystem or create some kind of profit motive that brings together tools and a community that, that yeah. you can sell into for that. And, and just to, to, to push you friendly as a friend of Microsoft, um, a, in the gaming community, the mod process is really powerful, which is the you can't build your own game, but you can mod it. And I was actually on the floor of CES with the head of learning for UPS, the Brown Company, who walked up to one of the Microsoft Xbox people and said, we'd like to put one in every station for every driver worldwide to, do, to use this as our primary learning uh, tool. 
And the answer was, well, that's not our business that we're in, you know. And he never talked about the millions of dollars that UPS might spend on that. But, but if you think virally, then partially you think about what the role of the mod, and that's probably what you're saying in terms of templatizing. But how can we create communities of modification that allow you to get a core game of $4 million, but then get mods for 100000 or 150000 and it's a, it's a very good point. I, I know the Xbox team is looking down right. long term at, at right. learning, but I think more in specific geographies like China. Right. Uh, one great example, if you go to discoverykids.com, yeah. there's a game called World Ball. And what it does is it, it sets up a series of ramps and catapults where you drop a marble into one side of a maze and your target is somewhere else. Which is, it's really great. You, you play the game once and it says, okay, now there's only 40 million people ahead of you in your score. So you can play it again and it goes up. But what you quickly realize is that you can go in there and create your own game and that gets put into the set and you can see the success rate that other people have on that. So being able to, to modify a game that way or to modify learning that way is really powerful. Uh, we had an uh, interesting conversation with the uh, New York State Bar Association about was there a role that gaming could play in attorney continuing education. Now this was, I felt like I was a stranger in a strange land when this was happening. Um, and all the conversation was it wouldn't happen, it couldn't happen alike. So we went to one law firm to do a little field test and all we did in that law firm is we took traditional very boring continuing ed courses but at the end of the course they were able to define a warrior name for themselves. It wasn't their real name. And then get they got a high score, which we posted on a plasma screen in the partner lunchroom. Well, what do you think happened in that law firm? The lawyers were taking the continuing ed, who they normally grumped about taking it once. Some lawyers took it 11 times to try to beat, you know, litigator Bob, you know, to get high score in that situation. And when I talked to their director of education at the Bar Association, he said, well, what happened here? I said, well, what you did was you actually unleashed intensity. That so much of what we do in our learning and even in our marketing and in our professional stuff is to lower the flame. And once you allow the flame to kind of get up and to be more intense and to get some inter-competition and team competition, and one of the law firms said, well, maybe we could just open it up so we could have inter-litigator you know, inter leagues and, and, and the like, um, you've got a whole other intensity with, with that. If, back to the three of you for a second. If you, if you could accomplish anything, if you could try a, an Uber experiment in this field that would benefit Microsoft and your user community and, and, uh, and the health of your company, what, what's something that you, you wish you could do with this? Um, I would love to be able to create a service where anybody, because anybody's a subject expert on something, could come in and create um, a really short lesson that would be searchable, like a web service that other people could look through and then apply their own metadata to so you could see whether it was effective or whether it was technically accurate, and then be able to drop all of these learning nuggets into something like a learning inbox where when they have free time, when they've got 10 minutes to learn something that they were interested in, they could actually go in and create their own curriculum and use it as they're going. Mm -hmm. I think, from, just speaking for my, my, my group's sake as well as my own, I think we'd like to create something where richer content is created that's educational at some scale geographically in places like India, China, Brazil, Russia, as well as here, um, that goes well beyond just the HTML learning that we see today. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm less substantial than they are, and so I will caveat this, but the first thing that came to my mind is launching Longhorn without any advertising, and Longhorn is the next right. major of Windows that we sell. So just try something where we never put a dollar in TV or in magazines, and we we invest it differently. Mm -hmm. And 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 almost by by doing that, you break you break the expectation set. In that, yeah, you, you'd have to you'd have to start thinking about fundamentally alter, altering the nature of awareness that mm -hmm. we create through advertising, altering altering the nature of um, and the role of the media in how it creates perception, and certainly changing the role that our customers play and our early adopter customers or, or watchers play in how we work. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what we thought we would do is to open this up. And Dick, why don't you why don't you kind of set up the, this next activity here? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> we wanted to get you a little bit of chance uh, to work together as uh, as groups, which I know you're all really looking forward to. But the point here is that uh, one of the one of the email responses I got when I sent this out was an awful lot of people wanted to know, well, how do I go do this? How do I make this happen? And we're going to make you all experts. Uh, on the SharePoint, we have a, a, if Corey wants to come up here and uh, show us, on the SharePoint, we have uh, the, the end result of some small group work here for about 20 minutes. We want you to sit at a table with people that uh, says podcasting and come up with what are the five steps, what are the ten steps to get from here to there. Do you have to go out and find out what podcasting is? Do you have to buy some equipment? Do you have to find a hosting place? But uh, some of you have probably gone through this experience a little bit. We have some links here that you can go to get some information on. And we're going to give you about 20 minutes to do that, and we're going to have a, a roaming uh, camera guy wandering around the room for the webcast, so don't get too uh, too concerned if he comes by, uh, to, try to, to try to give you an idea of what you need to do from here on. Um, so often these kind of workshops, you get, you get all excited and all interested, and then you go back to your day job. So we're going to try and get you uh, an outline of where you need to go. I also need to introduce one member of the team, Corey Hines back here, who's been my demo dolly. Uh, Corey uh, is uh, working with me on something we're calling a rapid feedback tool. Uh, you'll notice that we've had things up on the screens, and he's been showing you sites when Elliot was talking. Uh, when I work with large rooms that I try to do educational work in, we're experimenting with new ways to give you information besides this one guy with the microphone. Uh, you also notice we encourage you to come and bring your laptops on the walk-in uh, PowerPoint. We encourage you to go up and look at the SharePoint while you're there. We're trying to find interesting and new ways that you can get at information rather than just that one-to-many model. So feel free to continue that during the rest of the uh, experience here today. And I'll have Corey uh, doing that as we do our, our discussion and close that he'll bring up some interesting things on the screen. And, and if you've got some questions for me or yep. some of the other panelists, we'll, as soon as we do this 20-minute yep. piece, we'll We'll come back to that. Yep. So what we'd like you to do is, uh, Corey's going to put up uh, the, the, he's got a link uh, on the main page of the SharePoint there, and maybe one person at each table who happens to have a machine. Some of you who are kind of by yourselves could go find another table. Um, and we just pick something and try to work together as a group and come up with ways that you think we, you'd be able to implement this. Uh, another reason for why we're doing this is one of the big requests we had from people was to get to meet people they could use as resources. So introduce yourself around the table, and we'll take about 15, 20 minutes. Then we'll bring it back uh, together. Uh, for a question and answer and a little review of some of the things that people have put up there. And finally, just a little bit of talk about what next steps we might have for people who want to continue working in this. Thanks. How are you? Just call me. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Just one last thing. Corey pointed out to me. After you've come up with some plans, the very last link on that SharePoint says look at other people's plans. And you could spend about five minutes at the end of your experience looking at what some other people came up with. And we'll be going around the room and letting you give a chance to you know, talk a little bit about what you did and what you saw there. But feel free to share all this stuff right now.
guess the closest to them would be the pocket SEQs. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's really on a small scale, Basis, but we have one guy that develops um, some of our training materials into like pocket org charts and things like that that we can push out to like pocket people or smartphones. And we don't really use it a lot. We just kind of have like top ten lists. David Letterman said, push it out. And do you guys contribute content to like the drive time things, like that little field that goes out and talks about products or whatever? No, but uh, I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like podcasting, right? It's just internally we do it. Yeah. We spend a lot more money on it. We so burn it to CDs and mail a lot of people. And so the cool thing about podcasting, as I just was looking at this today, is that it works off of uh, you know XML. And you can subscribe to it. And whenever it's updated, it automatically downloads it into your little reader or whatever. And it's there. It's local. It's you can play it on demand. And so... Kind of the same with the RSS feeds and stuff like that. It's actually pretty cool stuff. So, I mean, if you have training, you know, that gets updated, you just update it automatically, will notify the user, hey, you know, we've got some updates to this training, they go in and view it, read it. It's actually pretty cool. But, I mean, it's pretty simple. In podcast, you just create a WMV file, WMA, and upload it to your FTP server. And, subscribe to it. So is our goal here to try and write like a quick 10 steps of how you go publish a uh, podcast? Five. Five steps. Yeah. So I have a question. How would you go create an audio file on, like if I wanted to do one for, you know, deployment or something? Movie maker. I'm just thinking of Microsoft tools. Fire up uh, yeah. Well, sometimes on your PC they have like sound recorder software. You just plug a microphone in and just start talking. Then it's like under accessory. I think so. It's entertainment. Amazing. And you can save it as a WMJ, WAVE or whatever. So, uh, hey, it has a limit of 60 seconds. So that tool's not going to work. The Windows guys let us down. <laughs> got to talk really quick. Got to talk really quick to make real short. I think there's a number of tools you can download to, to record. If you're doing um, like a demo or simulation tool, you can record it. There are a lot of software programs out there that do screen capture, and you can add audio to that and export it as Flash or WMD or Waves. Now you have to export it as something that people who use podcasting. So you guys are thinking of using it on your desktop. Is kind of what you're thinking, right? Well, then they just drag it over. You make that file first. So you make the file first, and then you okay. put it through your whatever tool you're using to broadcast or podcast. And then the user has to have some kind of a reader. You can also jump around a little bit with blogs too. Yeah. Um, let's finish up the podcast. No, that's okay. No, I, I want to figure this out. Like, I want to go post on my blog today a podcast. Of, podcast. No, a podcast oh, of something that? about some bug we're having in Visual Studio oh, right now. Right. Yeah. Like a workaround. So what I found is there's there's a couple of different tools you have to have. One to you can go to different newspapers and stuff or websites and they have podcasts, but you have to have a uh, tool that you download them to. Um, the subscription tool. One that I was using is called iPodder. You just go to okay. iPodder. iPodder.org. And then there was another one you can use to. It, all it really does to upload it is creates the XML file and then attaches the subscriptions to it, so that when on the other end the subscriber is tied into the XML file, when the XML file gets updated, it automatically will pull the content down locally. Is that a free tool or is that? Yeah, they were both free. And there's also a podcasting discussion area. I think it's podcasting discussion. 
RSS Radio, iPodder, Blog Matrix, Spark. Do you guys, any of you guys use any of these? Good to hear. Everybody's talking. Let's uh, take keep talking. That's okay. Uh, let's take about another five minutes. Try and finish something up and post it up there on the uh, SharePoint. Go to that uh, go to that link and put what you think your next four or five steps would be, even if you're not complete. And then we'll be able to spend a little time looking at what other people have posted. So go ahead and post something up there for us, and then spend some time looking at what other people have done. Are they all set up like that? I only know of you create a blog and you can add, enable other people to contribute or add. So, um, so what is the action plan? Go to podcast. Podcasting. Find out as much as you can about podcasting. Yeah. So we'll learn about what is about what about podcasting. What benefits. Then how do you? Uh, but do it. Podcasting. Uh, where do we go? You just that? download the software to your your audio device. Is what that oh. website says. Oh, for so example, either... RSS reader. Yeah. yeah. So where did you go? I'm on the podcasting from Wikipedia, Free Encyclopedia. Wikipedia. We're on the Digital Music Museum podcast. Okay, so we're going to learn then what is the second step. We're going to download the software and try it. Yeah. Download the software. Try it from either your computer your, or an iPod or digital audio device. Sure you can. And different audio What is Okay, so we, we learn what it is, we try it. Uh, are we doing it? Have we downloaded it? Now that we have to do, we have to make a podcast? Um, I um, don't have it on that one. Okay, make a podcast. I still can't find where you're selling anything. We're not selling anything. About tomorrow. We are actually here. That's right. We are. We are. We are. We're going to make a podcast about that. Let's try it. 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 Publishers create audio content posting on their website for listeners. Create or edit an existing RSS feed to the audio file file and even closure field. Are we downloading? Um, no, not for real. You can if you want. No. <laughs> well, we're just writing the plan. Yeah. 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 Then we would test it and then start our own feed or for. It says. Why would we not want to go just download? Well, you do it. Teaching somebody here. So are we putting together now? How? So we, we put together a podcast and we invite people to it. Right. We create a series of files that would be applicable to the topic. And then, yeah, as long as we don't invite them, it's not the real. Yeah. It's not so hard, yeah. There's actually money coming on. Oh, it's going to yeah. yeah, it says publish, publisher creates audio content posted to the website for listeners. To create or edit an existing RSS feed, including a link to the audio file, um, upload it to the website, and then tell the world that a podcast is available. Okay, yep. tell the world. No, we tell like the world. And then we the We should measure the results. What well, should we name our podcast? I don't know. I was suggesting doing something about tomorrow's wedding. Oh, about my wedding? Yeah. <laughs> the what? Yeah. About my wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do that. Yeah, so that. 
This is your wedding? Hey. Yeah. When is your wedding? Oh, perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, so it gives us time to download the software. See, I'm not invited, but you can listen to yeah, my wedding. Uh, <laughs> the new chief wedding. There you go. Can you say what's going well, as you can see, uh, we still don't have any responses up there, and uh, this is one of the fun things that you get when you're depending on uh, viral content building. We haven't uh, built a lot of content yet, so see if you can get something up there for us, and we'll wrap up in a couple of minutes, and then while we're doing our uh, uh, closing Q&A, you can uh, review what some other people have done. Okay, that's our plan. Yeah, okay. That's our plan. We're going to put in the podcast. Yeah, I guess invite everybody. So you need to know what you're talking about. Yeah, I guess a lot of people have. The automatic download is as far as the sexy podcasting is different. No, I don't know. Yeah, like they're saying, you know, some people are saying you can go to an NPR site and download their audio or go to any radio site and download it. But it's the automatic download part. Yeah, I'm going to have to get you to the to whatever device you're wanting it for you to then play it whenever you want that makes podcasting very different. So. And can you search, like, how do you search for a podcast? I guess they must have a description. Are you going to have a search engine? Is there, like, a, yeah, there are people who are subscribed, which is podcast out there, or how would you? Well, there was this one, Botnet Rocks. Botnet Rocks? Yeah. Oh, okay. There is an example of a great podcast. Oh, really? Uh, there, it's, it's on the site. It's on one of the links. Searching on an RSS oh, radio Okay, as you can see, we have our winner. Someone actually did post something up here, so that was uh, pretty cool. You can all go take a look at that. Uh, thanks for taking some time. Uh, sounds like we had some real good conversations. I saw a lot of people uh, rummaging around in the SharePoint while you were there. Uh, when I put up the link for the feedback, one of the questions I'm going to ask is, what did you think about having things wandering on the screen up behind the presenter while he was talking? And what did you think about the idea of being able to go out onto a SharePoint and look at information right while you were uh, hearing the presentation? We're really trying to figure out how to use some of this in our uh, external shows and with our customers, and so you're my uh, crash test dummy, sir. Hmm. Uh, what we're going to do is Elliot's going to kind of help us close this all back up. We're going to take uh, Q&A here for about a half an hour, and then at 3.30, like we said, we'll uh, sort of close down. And uh, we, w we do have the room until 4, so if you want to hang out and chat with people or still talk with any of our panelists that can stay, that'll be great. Thanks. I, I had the terrifying experience of... Uh giving a keynote speech to a very large conference and there was a real-time blog over my shoulder. Uh, so there were probably four or five thousand people in the room and there was this huge screen about four times that size and there were ten people on wireless who all had access to that blog, you know. And at one point I said something and somebody said, a load of crap, you know. And there was a little LCD monitor in front of me and my first reaction was to get defensive about that. But as soon as, as, soon as it said a load of crap, the audience said, we don't agree, you know. So there was this, this uh, it was an interesting view of what happens with an audience. Is an audience supposed to sit? Or is an audience supposed to actually do something with it? Uh, I'd like to open it up to uh, the group here, either for reactions, questions for me or any of the panelists. Uh, what were some of the issues that percolated in your groups? Maybe one of the uh, responses you had here. Uh, you know, contrarian, positive, or other views. So uh, let's open it up. And I'm going to play uh, Oprah here and get you a microphone so we can get you on the webcast. that you want us to think by having that panel and asking them the question and really Mac, tapping into your subject matter experts right here in the room. So that was great to see that right away. Uh, th th thank you. And, and, and intriguingly, the very, best, the very best times, by the way, I've seen Bill speak has been when he's been interviewed. 
Uh, I was at a, a show he did for Wall Street Journal, and uh, and Walt Mossberger does the interview, and he won't let anybody speak. He just sits down and does an interview. You get the best out of a subject matter expert often when you have a dialogue with them rather than you put them up with the teleprompter and, 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 and the like. So, other Other questions, perceptions, curiosities, wishes? So... Just uh, your quick thoughts on, you know, traditional classroom training, on-demand training, where it's going. I mean, today things are crazy, moving very quickly. And, you know, I remember once you mentioned something about uh, an analogy with the uh, airline kiosks. Right. Uh, four phenomena. I'll really respond. I know some of the folks here are in the learning field and some are not. One is that we're seeing a tremendous pressure on the reduced duration of all classroom instruction throughout at least North America, but we're seeing similar overseas. Five-day classes, pressure to make them three. Three-day classes, pressure to make them one. One-day physical events, half-day, uh, three-hour thing, do a webcast. Uh, second phenomenon we're seeing is a parallel that people aren't wanting to come to a room to sit and listen. That, in fact, if people want to go to a class, they actually want to go to do something functional, whether it's to work on a technology, to do a project, to get reaction, to get feedback. So the, the sage on the stage model is under some assault by that. The third is a perception that it's risky to be away from work that long. Uh, there is a strong sense of that my manager and my peers won't, even though they authorize it, they won't fully approve. I'll get... Um, retaliatory work from my colleagues and the like if I'm away and that I may actually slip in in my element. The last piece which we see is a, an intriguing phenomenon as well is a move away from compression to extension which means there's some things you want to learn quickly but there are many things you actually want to learn over a longer period of time. Um, I had a, an argument with uh, the head of uh, University of Phoenix, the Apollo Group. I said, you could make a fortune by offering a 10-year-long MBA program. Imagine if you could sign up for an MBA program that took 10 years. It might only, you know, it wouldn't cost any more than a normal MBA program. It wouldn't disrupt. You wouldn't have to leave your job. Think of how many people would sign up for an MBA program. So our whole model, which has just been compression, a lot of what we're talking about is, the, is playing with time. It's time shifting. It's time compression. It's also time extension. Um, so that we're, you know, we're going to have to play more with that process. The hardest challenge is that the business models for these things haven't kept up with the innovation. So I keep getting asking, but can we make money on it? Can we recover our revenue on it? And the like. Uh, and some of it may have to shift, as scary as it is, to pay for outcome rather than to pay for delivery. So this is the cost to get certified. And by the way, here are four or five resources to get you certified. But you pay for the outcome rather than pay for, pay for the delivery. Hi. Um, I was interested to hear to what extent you think corporate entities can uh, participate in community-driven efforts. So things like Wikipedia, for example, if Microsoft were to try and create a competitive product, we might have a, a hard time due to the very nature of the uh, open, open and altruistic nature of it. Uh, yeah, uh, let me let me talk. Yeah. Considering that I run the Encarta team, you know, I can probably comment on that. Um, we actually do have uh, a community editing system on Encarta now, and uh, the way we handle it, because we sell a lot into schools and we're selling to primary schools and secondary schools, um, there's a high risk factor if things are wrong, kids get them wrong in tests, whatever. Um, we actually instituted it about... Uh, uh, well, probably about four months ago, three or four months ago, and the way we launched it's interesting, you know, relating to blogging, because we, we launched it just with a blog. We didn't do any announcement. We, we did no press release. We did nothing, but there was an AP story written on it just based on our blog. Um, so that was our press release. Effectively, it was an AP press release based on our blog. We find about 20 to 30 percent of what we get is valid, and, and uh, 70 to 80 percent is invalid. And some of it is, is ad hominems against Microsoft. Some of it's spurious. Some of it's just questions, et cetera. 
Um, that said, you know, Wikipedia, you know, my, my hat's off to them. They do a, a phenomenally wonderful job. It's simply, you know, they are so effective and they're free that even if we are as effective as Wikipedia and how they do it, there's no profit motive in us doing that. So, you know, our focus has shifted to be more around tools and homework and things like that. But I, I would say our experience just in terms of the ad hominems of Microsoft it was quite high. And you, you do see some spurious behavior in Wikipedia, but far less than directed at a corporation. That said, there probably are ways to mitigate that Elliot can comment on. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, all I would add is think about layers. You know, in, in other words, in many situations, uh, what, you're, what you do with Encarta, it's not necessarily Microsoft content. You're a publisher of that. So to the extent that you have your publisher hat on, think about publishing along the continuum. You're publishing from official sources. You're publishing from social sources. So now you want to open it up. Well, maybe there's the PTA of Binghamton, New York, is the is your partner for publishing Binghamton content. So they're not going to the Microsoft at Binghamton.edu, but they're going to the PTA. And once again, you stay in the tools area and the like. I mean, I had a great argument with um, uh, the head of the American Textbook Society who was, uh, was concerned about what was going to happen with digital textbooks. I said, ultimately, we'll pay more for the yellow highlighting than for the textbook. So, in other words, I'll pay more for the good underlining that happens in the textbook. In fact, when I was in college, I worked at the bookstore, and I had a little side business. I'd figure out the GPA of the people returning used books to us, and I'd write it in the back of the, of the book. So people who were my friends knew to only buy the highlighting from somebody who got an A in the course versus a, a B or a C. But think about it, the context layer may be worth more than the content layer. And that's where I think the sweet spot is. And to that extent, you're not publishing it. You're reselling. You're just reselling great context there. Other, uh, other questions, curiosities, thoughts? In the back, Dick? You mentioned the Audi A4 um, blog, if you will, yeah. that's become more powerful than what anything Audi can do. W what should we be doing? To, should we be out in front of it from a marketing perspective and expect it's going to happen and we should just encourage it or should we respond to it or we should embrace it? I mean, as, a, as a, someone trying to put out marketing messages, if you will, and someone else does it better than us, what should we be doing? Well, let me get one of these marketing folks and I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. So, um, I was just saying, can you say slash dot, right? It's, I, I think that it's out there. And I think it's, it's important that it stays out there and stays completely unfettered. I don't think the strategy should be to get out ahead of it. The strategy should be to articulate what it is that we believe and how it is that we actualize what we believe and not try and spin it. Because it's very easy to see through that. And, and what it does is it gets discounted. So the filter or the context layer that will be applied on that is, well, I'm really not sure about the authenticity of this material. The reason I think Channel 9 does so well is because it is essentially unfettered. It doesn't have, it, it has more opinion and more reality and less spin. And I think that's the really important dimension that I would want to see in whatever we came out with, is be honest about what we do, how we do it, how easy it is, how hard it is, where we make money, where we don't, whatever. And kind of go, go that way. That would be my view. I, I don't know. And, and the other thing I would add to it is, the, the ability to view this as an experiment in works is the critical element of it, which means that some of the, you know, we're talking about the successes. There have been a lot of failures in social networking, social content, and the like. So part of it is to say, if you do it ad hoc, you can have some failures. It's, you know, you, you're going to try a variety of things. Some of them will stick, some, will, some of them will not. But sometimes it's also to not go for your instinct of stopping it. Because I've seen some Fortune 500 companies be really dumb in trying to stop. I got to tell you, they were a day away from shutting down that website in Iraq. And people would have lost their lives with that because their command and control instincts were so strong, they wanted to shut that down. So some of the instinct is not to get out in front of it, but in some ways to step to the side, watch it happen, and jump when you can. Or at least open yourself up and be willing to be asked and respond 
with candor. And so we were just talking a, a little bit during our um, our side conversation here about um, some. Often I get asked to speak to MBA classes at universities, and I will go talk to them, and I will go for 90 minutes, and I don't take a PC with me, I don't take a, a little thumb drive with a presentation on it. I just introduce myself and say, "Here's what my job is," and let them add it. And for the first five or ten minutes, I'm going to get a lot of feedback, if you can call it that, about what we do wrong. You know, how we do open source, how we don't do open source, how we uh, take advantage of our strength, don't do things, don't empower people, whatever it is that, we, that they feel some angst about. And then what I say is, okay, so let's figure out how we fix it. So I write all that on the board, and I say, here are the issues. So based on the constraints that we operate under, whether they are regulatory constraints, whether they're fiscal constraints, whether they're um, transparency constraints, here's what we can do. And then here's what our shareholders want from us. They want these kinds of margins. They want this kind of revenue stream. They want this kind of growth. So now you help me figure out how we return to a better place with you. And just opening it up to them, and we will have a conversation for 90 minutes about that, is really, really in interesting. Because at the end of it, the feedback that they give you is, is a little bit less negative than it was when it started, and substantially more empathetic to our position and our situation. And that's where I think we can make um, a, a better impact on, on the perception of Microsoft and how we market ourselves. There's, I think there's another thing here that's related. Yeah, I, I can't remember what state it was, but one of the New England states, the governor, um, had set up a web page with the entire budget done with little sliders where you could go in and look at all of the different revenue sources and you could up taxes and you could lower taxes, gas taxes, you know, I would slide it to the left. And, and then you would also have all the different ways that you could spend the money. And everyone comes into that site with such opinions, but when you try and actually go through all of the sliders, you make a mess of things. You have a huge deficit. And if you can actually make something work, you hit a submit button and it goes right to the, the governor's office. So it really gave a better understanding of what they were trying to do. Let me, let me also add one uh, comment from what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to speak to 6,000 engineers tomorrow morning in downtown Seattle who are here for the International Quality Conference. And initially I didn't know if it meant they were just good people and got invited or like, but they're actually part of quality improvement, lean manufacturing, Six Sigma. They're the corporate directors of that. And last night I stopped in to just sniff out the group to see what they were like. And I didn't introduce myself. I was just doing that kind of needs assessment, social networking at the bar. And uh, when I start to talk about this stuff with them, now remember, they're in charge of rapid high velocity improvement of manufacturing. And one guy said, well, this sounds really interesting, but we can't control it. What happens if suddenly somebody shows we have a problem somewhere and our, and our shareholder sees it or the like? We can't control it. And I looked at him and I said, you don't get it. You're using an industrial model and you're trying to be a in compliance company in this age. A good example, I'm on four corporate boards. I had to take Sarbanes-Oxley training for each one. Guess what? Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't give me a merit badge. So each board I have to take it all over again. Now I want to get the belt. I want to wear it. You know, I want to put it on my sleeve. Not, that, not as a recognition of pure honor. I just don't want to waste on the next board another day going through that training. So there's a whole model to look at of how do we granularize some of this stuff and how do we look at this from uh, for one second, I keep going to velocity and intensity because those to me are two of the really interesting social and business drivers here. Um, Dick? I'm, I'm going to select myself for a question here. I guess I should get at least one. Uh, my job right now is creating content for really large events, and I'm uh, right now we're getting close to a terabyte of lab information at TechEd, not to mention all of the breakouts, not to mention all of the cabanas and all that stuff. I'd like to hear from the panel and from Elliot, how can we be thinking about this flood, this fire hose of content that we create around this company, and, and breaking it into pieces that work in this kind of method? Uh, not pasting in a marketing message, but how do we share all this information? Yeah. Let me just give a, a quick one sentence and point it down. Uh, we have to realize that the generational shift, and it's generational by time, not by age, is towards reference versus swallowing. Our old model of content was give it to me and I will eat it. 
My new model is let me know where it is and that's cool till I need it in that process. And so one of the metaphors here is how do you let me leave with all the right pointers? And then I want to spend my face time in large meetings, having intense conversations, being part of appropriate gated or ungated communities, and an opportunity to test my skills and or to try experiences that I can't do at work, whether they are your Uber labs or other elements uh, like that. It's a little bit outside my domain, so I'll pass it over. Actually, I think one of the most interesting experiments with using learning as a marketing tool is something that Dick is trying right now. So do you want to describe what you're doing with the games? Yeah, we did a little experimentation. Uh, Robert has a, a, a learning game called the drop game where uh, a, a word or a phrase comes down and you have to decide, does it go into this bucket or that bucket? Kind of a standard little learning thing. Uh, his first one was, uh, w was this movie in the 1970s, the 1980s, or the 1990s? And every single person that I showed that thing to had to play it at least ten times to see if they could make their score faster. It was extremely addictive. And we experimented with that with, I believe it was an exchange conference, as a way to pre-teach people before the show in that I'd give you an Xbox if you got the best time on that and then at the show we'd have a playoff on the big screen uh, up in front of everybody and you'd get the trip to Hawaii. Uh, and it's amazing how you can use that kind of learning either pre or post to generate buzz and excitement and interest but also sneakily I was teaching them how to categorize and exchange migration. Uh, and so there's, there's wonderful ways you can use those tools and really what it cost me was somebody to write some questions and, and a couple of toys to give away. You know, it was not a huge thing. I already had all those names because I was going to have a thousand people in Phoenix for the show. So it, it's really pretty simple sometimes to add this stuff on. Um, so we're actually gathering some community content for some of the work that I'm doing. And one question I've got is, given that we're Microsoft, how do we get users to give us the sort of goodwill to be willing to invest in a community that we have the way that they'd invest in a Wikipedia, the way that they'd invest in a Slashdot, and you know, feel good about being part of a community that's hosted on the servers of the evil empire? Uh, three, three things. One is... I'll say it. It's, it's being broadcast. So um, you have to lose your own self-doubt. You have to lose your own self-doubt. Uh, the reason that people give me a tremendous amount of free content is that I really believe that I'm going to act ethically on it. So, so at some level, you have to stop being worried about being the evil empire. Uh, because when you're worried about being the evil empire, you'll act in a paranoid fashion and become the evil empire. You know, so some of it is lose yourself out. But but the two might be more pragmatic elements of it. People will experiment with communities. I'm probably no different than you. I'll try something. I'll go on and I'll say, hmm, you know, that link. Let me go there. Is that a marketing site or is that a real site? So I'll try something. Okay, and I'll and I'll quickly sort it. Good, bad, maybe. Okay. The second piece is build a reward for them, and it doesn't have to be monetary. And you said it very well. You know, it has to be social. It has to be cool factor. Imagine if the folks back when Windows 95 came out had thought about having a 10-year competition for solitaire. You'd have the largest multiplayer game in the universe right now. <laughs> Yeah, okay, no, but think about it. I mean, literally. Uh, so some of it is thinking about what the social world. I will tell you, if you're authentic, if you're not paranoid, if, 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 it is, if it creates real value, it will sustain itself. Now, it, doesn't, it may not become the same as, a, you know, as quote, a not-for-profit will, in the same sense that no blood bank can do what the Red Cross can, because that's a different business model. But you're not trying to be the Red Cross. You're trying to be a profitable, innovative, engaged company. But lose yourself down and, and really try to have what you do be authentic. And, uh, and you've, you've created innovation your entire corporate history. This is another moment of innovation in which you take a deep breath and you've got to do some things different and have the courage to stop doing some things. I was just going to say one more thing is there are communities we've built like Channel 9 and do you guys know what Channel 9's marketing plan is or what their marketing budget is? 
Well, there isn't one, and it's zero. And the way they became successful is there was no way from MSDN.com to get to Channel 9. It was completely viral. So I would start with a couple of people, and I'd ask them how you should grow it and how they should want to be uh, more substantive participants. What would it take to keep you? Uh, kinds of questions. Or what it would it take to attract you? And if they give you answers that are good enough, then that would be a good start. I'd also say that for everybody, like we, we started doing community editing in Encarta. You know, we initially posted, uh, participated in a slash dot uh, thread about this, and you know, we got a lot of people basically, you know, def defaming uh, de Microsoft and whatever. But there was an undercurrent of people who understood where we were coming from and the fact that we were open with them about what our intentions were, why we were doing it, was respected and appreciated. So, though I think that's it may be kind of a fringe that you'll just never get to. There's a lot of people in the middle, you know, who are more than happy to participate. I think. Yeah, let's do let's do one more, and then we can kind of wrap it up. Dick, why don't I switch it around to do okay. something highly participative? Okay, I'd love to go around the room very rapidly. I can do it. I, I'd like you to very rapidly, and we can do this in about two and a half minutes, but I'd like you to throw out one word that would, you know, if you had to just type a word up, you can do that as well, but if you had to throw out one word that summarizes what you're thinking about after this conversation. So, Dean, why, why don't you start there? One word. It's two words, but rapid updates. Participation. Content validation. Velocity. Just quick and dirty. <laughs> Transparency. Feedback. Uh, participation. Indexing. Refinement. Communities. Intensity. Um, not not recreating everything, but using what's already out there. Uh, user focus. Uh, discovery. Trust. Innovation. Curiosity. She's talking about innovation. Paradigm shift. Useful. Interactive. Fun. Customer focused. Worldwide. Connected. Powerful. Free. <laughs> Independence of learning. Affinity. Credibility. Community involvement. Creativity. Instant learning. Viral. User run. And, it, and what about the, the panel? Just... Empathy. Uh, interactive. Truth. Yeah. Uh, if I could, if I could wrap up with two sentences, maybe to stretch that. Uh, what we just did is a metaphor for what we're talking about. Uh, you know, in other words, if you have a group in a in a, in, a, in a process, you can write a feedback form that goes to one person, or you could publish those words to the whole group. Uh, one last piece we didn't talk about: if you think blogging and wikis are a phenomenon in the United States, look beyond the border. Um, it is seen there as a leveling of the first, second, third world concept of access to information. And so the phrase velocity and intensity really says something about that. And I shared with the panelists a little bit, McDonald's has this challenge that they've got a content that has to flow to 121 countries where they have 1.5 million people that quit McDonald's every year and have to be replaced. 
and when they want to revise a salad, they want to do it now within five to eight days, not 18 months. But content took them to be translated up to two years to get to the last language. So we're now holding their hand while they take a deep breath and say, in every country there's somebody who speaks English plus the local language. Maybe we don't translate it all at Hamburger University. Maybe what we do is we put the English and the graphics on the left side and give them a panel on the right side, a la a wiki or a blog or a SharePoint site or like, and somebody there translates it locally, and if they get it wrong, somebody who speaks both languages corrects it. So the speed to translation could be measured in minutes, not in two years. What do you think the board of McDonald's thinks about that? Now, they're worried about Sarbanes-Oxley because they don't want it to say, you know, eat the paper cup. And, you know, uh, but on another level, their speed to profitability and their speed to change, in part, is measured by the velocity of knowledge within their organization. So think about this not as a U.S. phenomenon. And when you talk to your colleagues in other parts of the world, they will see wikis as a democratization of knowledge within the corporate structure and infrastructure. And I... Keep that in mind. It has been an honor to be with you here, and I want to thank Dick for that, and I'll hand it over to uh, Shadan. I hope some of you get to Orlando to be part of our learning event. Great. Thank you, Elliot and panel. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Corey, for helping us. Uh, thank you, MSN guys, doing a webcast on uh, about 24 hours notice and getting this all put together. Uh, thank all of you for uh, participating. I think this is really cool. Uh, my one request for your next step is you go to the uh, SharePoint and sign up for the discussion list. And from here, I guess my plans are if this was something useful and something interesting to you, I'm going to try to do this again in a couple of months with somebody else and kind of keep this community growing and going and uh, finding ways that we can use each other and share experiences and